Thank you very much indeed, Emma. Thanks to Jim, our technical officer tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here at Nottingham Contemporary. I'm shocked to say it's the first time I've been to the gallery, which obviously says much more about me than it does about the gallery, which I'm incredibly impressed by, not least by the um, film programme. Um, we're forced to charge uh, at the Whitechapel Gallery, as most London gallery programmes are, um, are want to do, and it's a great pleasure to be part of a programme that is you know, free uh, admission-wise, and such a rigorous programme as well. So um, many thanks again for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how much uh, many of you will know about Chris Marker, who will be the prime focus, I guess, of my comments before the films, um, although not exclusively, of course. Um, but before we go into uh, uh, anything I'm going to say, of course, we, we should uh, and we will uh, now note, of course, um, and mark with great regret the, um, the sudden passing last week of Haroon Faroqi, um, age 70, who very suddenly died in the middle of last week. Um, one of the great current essay filmmakers, very much in the spirit of and lineage of Chris Marker. Um, and of course, we're going to see a very distinctive uh, shorter film by Jill Godmillow before the main feature, um, which uh, uh, takes on, if you like, some of the key uh, tropes and motifs around this particular form of, of documentary, author documentary uh, moving image uh, called the essay film. But what Jill Godmillow does before we move on to the main feature um, is to remake frame for frame exactly, except in colour and in English this time, Haroon Faroqi's 1969 film Inextinguishable Fire, which examines uh, the rise, uh, the creation and the spread of napalm as manufactured by Dow Chemicals and of course um, one of the most destructive agents quite literally um, in the Vietnam uh, War. Uh, and so Faroqi, uh, very much uh, a key political, committed artist filmmaker, originally working in cinema, and moving in the later part of his life across the gallery, primarily because of funding restraints in the film world. But very, very much a fellow traveller, just 20 years or so younger uh, than Chris Marker, and very much in the same vein of this idea of the engaged essay. Uh, so, what, so what is the essay film? Because in a way, that's going to hold our, um, hold our thoughts, if you like, as, as the kind of vessel of this evening's program. Um, do stop me immediately and I will raise my game if all of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but the essay film, I guess, has developed out of um, its foundations. It's the kind of the, the ur text of the essay film was Zsigar Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera in the late 20s, which um, those of you who subscribe to Sight and Sound will see has just been voted um, the most important, the best, whatever that means, documentary of all time in their current documentary poll, a poll of peers and critics and so on. But of course the essay film is an authored documentary. It doesn't pour itself into the pre-existing template. It doesn't uh, borrow the moulds of a television or cinematic form. It finds the form to fit the content and is authored following the spirit of the literary essay, uh, which is why Chris Marker, perhaps the great exemplar of the essay uh, in cinema history, um, explicitly draws on the great French literary tradition of the essay going as far back as Montaigne. So the essay is a personal engagement with the reality of the the world, with history, with memory, with the issues uh, that the essay in particular is concerned with, um, that refuses, if you like, uh, a kind of fixed form and, and a fixed outcome. Um, essayer, the French word, means to try. And so very, very quickly we're in the space of a kind of sense of possibility, of sense of uncertainty, of doubt even, um, in which the outcome is uncertain, not least to the maker at the beginning of the process, um, but in which uh, within that doubt, within that uncertainty, all sorts of possibilities become apparent. And particularly uh, in this film, Far From Vietnam, we see many of these key kind of tropes of the essay, the essay film, um, being worked through. Uh, Far From Vietnam is a, is a key work in, in Marker's oeuvre, but it's important, before we get on to this particular film, to think about how Marker uh, entered the culture, uh, French culture initially, of course, but then world moving image culture. And I'd like to make a slight provocation at this point and make the claim that um, having worked very closely on the Chris Marker show at the Whitechapel, um, which recently finished, um, and becoming much more aware um, than I previously was about the full extent of Marker's work, I'd like to make the claim that, that Chris Marker, for us now, um, in the 21st century, is the most important moving image maker of the last century. Um, not because his oeuvre is the greatest, uh, the deepest, the most extensive, although it uh, has all those qualities and more, um, but because it offers the most avenues, if you like, for the moving image to travel through, the most platforms, the most ways of thinking about what the moving image is capable of doing in the 21st century. There are many, many great 
oeuvres within the cinema of the last century, of course, and we don't need to go through the roll call of names now. But most of them, in a way, offer a closed space. They offer ex an extraordinary universe uh, created by the maker um, that, that, that repays endless visits, of course, but doesn't necessarily show a way forward for the moving image. Whereas I think with Marker, it's very fair to say that across platforms, across forms, across aesthetics, um, across various forms of technology, um, he really does offer multiple ways forward um, that welcome uh, inclusivity, that welcome others to participate actively, that are not restrained by um, fetishization of certain forms of certain media, that are not uh, obsessed by budget uh, or constrained by um, some of the older spaces, the uh, less hybrid spaces that moving image has predominantly found itself within. Uh, so across an extraordinary body of work and across every possible form of artistic expression, uh, and particularly within the moving image, Marker is a kind of exemplar of what, uh, what the moving image can do, I think. Um, but it's important to remember that he didn't start within the moving image. Born in 1921, he died on his 91st birthday uh, in July 2012. And across that 91 years, as I said, he covered pretty much every form of expression. Uh, he was an active agent in the French Resistance, um, but in his early post-war years, um, he found himself allied, um, just because of background, a semi-aristocratic background, Chris Marker, of course, not his real name, a pseudonym adopted to take on a certain kind of internationalist position, um, one that has an Anglophone uh, origin, if you like, um, but of course very, very much uh, rooted himself uh, in the French culture and the French cultural tradition. Um, uh, after, the, after the war, he found himself allied, if you like, with, with, with uh, Gaulist politics to a certain degree. And so uh, in his early works, many of which he then suppressed, um, he found a different kind of political expression, but very, very quickly moved after his, of course, committed resistance position into a much more committed left position, um, which he maintained, of course, throughout his life. Far from dogmatic, although he was allied at certain points with key parties within the, within the French uh, political establishment, of course, um, not least the Communist Party, who, of course, always had a much more active and culturally engaged role than the communist parties we might think of in uh, certain other European countries and certainly in the Anglophone tradition. But he was a writer, a publisher, a graphic designer first and foremost. Some of you might know the Petit Planet series that he designed, a very, very influential series of uh, small travel books, I think up to 60 in total, which he provided most of the photography for and the design for with Edition du Soy, the great French publisher in the mid to late 50s, which became a template for innovative relationships between text and image, for example, not, uh, not least leading to uh, the design of uh, Ways of Seeing, which Richard Hollis designed with John Berger and Mike Deer, a key, uh, key example of the text and image engagement uh, underpinned by committed politics. Um, that would not have happened in the same way without Chris Marker's uh, prior uh, experiments with text and image in the Petit Planet series and many others. But he was a writer, he was an essayist, he was a critic like many of the Nouvelle Vague filmmakers. Um, he cut his teeth in engaging with film but was also a novelist, a short story writer. We're hoping um, as one of the uh, positive legacies of the exhibition at Whitechapel to be publishing uh, his first and only novel, The Forthright Spirit, an extraordinary prefacing, if you like, in novel form of key works like La Jete and Sans Soleil, um, which has been unseen since its 1951 translation. So watch this space. I'm not quite sure what exactly this space is that I mean at this point, but we're negotiating with the French publishers to republish uh, that novel uh, 65 years, of course, after it was first published and then rapidly disappeared. So he was a multi-talented, precocious young man, if you like, engaged at the heart of post-war French politics and culture. And in the mid-50s, he moved uh, into, uh, out, into uh, the essay form, if you like, of moving image and out of the essay on the page. But of course, he was effectively making this form. Um, there had been key uh, stops along the way, but it was very much a marginal form of filmmaking uh, since that uh, genesis, if you like, um, that we could argue started with, uh, with the great film Man with a Movie Camera that I mentioned. And he basically moved into a form of essay writing on film um, that allowed him to indulge his multifarious interests in a way that could let him follow his thoughts wherever he went. Um, and created a, a number of key travelogue films in the, in the mid to late 50s, uh, perhaps most prominent among them Letter from Siberia, where he made a committed position in relation to places and spaces, terrains and territories that were off the map 
of, of, of most of the, uh, the cultural elite and certainly off, off the map of most of, the, uh, most of the audiences that he was trying to reach. Some were commissioned in association with French film agencies, production houses, of course, and some were initiated off, off his own back, very low budget um, and, and self-motivated and initiated. But over the course of the late 50s and early 60s, he made a number of key, key essay works that kind of set, set the template for what he was going to be most renowned for, of course, um, later into his filmmaking career. And his most important film, I guess, in terms of the influence, the reach it's had, La Jetée, is obviously a fiction, uh, at least on, on its surface construction and its, in its narrative drive, but also shows a kind of essay relationship to its musings and ruminations on time and memory. Uh, and that was in 1962, of course, made at the height of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, of the, uh, the first phase, if you like, of the Cold War, Scares and Paranoia, is a film about trying to escape, uh, collapse, to, to move beyond... Uh, uh, the, the demolitions and the, and the uh, apocalypses of contemporary society to try and find a way back from the future to perhaps remake uh, the trajectory that we were finding ourselves on, of course, in the early 60s. And this was a key film which circulated, of course, very widely, very, very quickly and was immediately commented on as being uh, most significant in um, in Marcus Erver, of course, but also in filmmaking at the time. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the first film that he'd made, uh, only using, with one, of course, very notable exception, still images, um, but it was easily the most renowned and the most influential. But as he moved towards the mid-60s, of course, uh, being constantly aware of the political scene globally, travelling widely to Cuba, to Russia, of course, to China, um, uh, right across the uh, Soviet Union as well, um, he became more and more committed to finding a way to express politically, without rhetoric, uh, wherever possible, his concerns about uh, the current climate, of course, and the escalation, particularly as we're thinking tonight, of the war in Vietnam. Now, he was always a collaborator, and all the projects that I mentioned, in whatever form they took, were collaborations, and he has made something like 60 films under his own name, and perhaps 40 explicitly collaboratively. Um, and Far From Vietnam was one of the earliest and remains one of the most significant in that oeuvre of collaboration, made with six other filmmakers. Mark initiated the project, of course, um, and initiated it in 66, moving towards uh, release and circulation in 67, um, as a way of trying to to, trying to uh, express solidarity, of course, with the, with the Vietnamese people, but also to circulate much more widely um, a sense of awareness about um, the motivations behind and the escalation of the war. Now, we have to remember, of course, particularly in the US, that the 67 was not uh, uh, a year in which the radical... Uh, tropes, if you like, that we now take to be a given of the 60s were mainstream in the culture. That would come later into 68, of course, not least presaged by the crucial assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. But in 66 and 67, um, the rad radical positions of uh, groups like Students for a New Society, Students for a Democratic Society, rather than, of course, the nascent Black Panthers, was not a given um, in American society. It was growing, of course, and it was widespread. But it hadn't, hadn't entered, hadn't crossed over, if you like, tipped over into that, that mainstream of, of, uh, of at least uh, acquaintanceship, if you like, if not participation. So Marker um, found himself, of course, in the States. He found himself working across Europe with regular collaborators, um, particularly, we notice um, from the lineup here, with uh, Alain René, who he'd worked with as, as early as 1955 with a great film about the National Library of France called Toute la Mémoire du Monde. Um, René, obviously a major filmmaker in his own right, but he and Marker worked uh, together throughout the 50s and 60s with various roles taken by each in relation to the other's films. So the people that he was working alongside, primarily based in France, of course, um, William Klein himself, also in Paris, an American filmmaker in Paris, Joris Ivan's a Dutch filmmaker, of course, but equally with the radical associations that the Paris um, centre offered, if you like, um, came together, um, initiated by Marker's uh, invitation to respond uh, to the crisis in Vietnam as experienced by those of us, them, of course, in this situation, living in Europe or in the US. How did the Vietnam conflict find itself um, expressed, felt, responded to um, in, in the European and Western conf uh, 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 conflict, if you like, um, in, in the, in the, in the uh, situation of normal living in the West. Um, when I said conflict just then, that was a slip of the tongue, but also in a way it wasn't, because 
One can think of works by the great uh, American artist Martha Rosler called Bringing the War Back Home, where we see domestic uh, environments, photographic environments, where through the windows we see the Vietnam conflict photographically collaged into that space. Or works like Peter Brook's Us, US, um, the great collage uh, theatre piece that he made with the Royal Shakespeare Company, where Glenda Jackson's character, towards the end of the piece, um, asks the war to be brought back to the Hampstead Gardens, to the heaths, to the picnic areas, to find bodies and limbs on the grass, to know what it means to have the conflict undertaken in our name through ally, alliance with the US. What would it be to, like, to have the war come back to our own domestic and, and public spaces? So in a sense, that kind of shared motivation was underlying what Marker and his colleagues wanted to do. They wanted to find a way to tell the story of Vietnam through Western uh, and, and lived shared experience um, in the audiences that they were aiming for. But also, of course, by making explicit and apparent that solidarity to, to show uh, sympathy and empathy with the Vietnamese people. So that was, that was the project. Now, of course, you know, it's very difficult to imagine how that film would have been received then, of course, on this cusp between radical uh, mainstreamization, shall we say, um, and its underground position during the course of making. But I guess, needless to say, by mainstream critics, the film was very, very negatively, negatively received. It had one week's release in New York, where the New York Times and other leading critics um, roundly denounced it as uh, communist propaganda, um, rhetoric from the red side, etc., etc., um, similarly, and perhaps more surprisingly in France, um, it, the cinemas were attacked by extreme right-wing groups and the film was pulled in certain cases. Um, in countries that were sort of, certainly occupying a more middle ground position, like the UK, shall we say, um, it found a more favourable cinematic and critical response. The great British critic Ray Dergnat um, thought it was a wonderful inspirational text that for those young people in the age of Marshall McClure, and this was a great collage, a great call to take up your own 8mm camera, your own 16mm camera, and to make a kind of hybrid kaleidoscopic essay about those issues of the time that concern, uh, concern and energise you. So he had a mixed reception, but, but as, a, as a film in entering the critical canon, if you like, of cinema, it was roundly ignored and actively um, uh, denounced in certain places. Uh, it then disappeared very, very quickly and entered the, the much more extensive American college circuit, moving uh, on 16 mil prints for many, many years until the prints, of course, got more and more uh, dilapidated and decayed, as many, many radical films did um, through the course of the late 60s, 70s and 80s, but effectively disappeared from larger public view in any way, uh, shape or form. Uh, it was uh, restored in 2012 after being completely unavailable in any home formats um, and was premiered at Toronto and has directly uh, inspired a very similar project called Far From Afghanistan, initiated in a similar way to Marker by uh, the great American radical filmmaker John G. and Vito, where he invited, again, a similar number of fellow travellers to make their own episodic responses to the American presence in Afghanistan, a film that circulated in not dissimilar ways to Far From Vietnam, and, of course, in a very different cultural climate. So I think, although it's possible now historically to argue of the significance of, of the film we're about to see, um, both in film culture, of course, and its covert influence, if not fully seen for many years, is certainly known about and used as a reference point by subsequent filmmakers. Um, far from Afghanistan enters a very, very different, uh, much more deforested film culture, shall we, shall we say, um, where cinemas are increasingly uh, homogenizing their programming, where repertory and, uh, and world cinema venues are closing down, not least in London, among many other places, of course, and where the sense of a collective audience for these kind of films is now atomized across private viewing platforms, of course, online, DVD and other formats, um, but not in that shared collective sense that we're about to experience, of course, which is very crucial, very important to these kind of films, that they're experienced in solidarity with people in the audience, as well as, of course, in larger senses of collective screening globally. So very, very different times for radical filmmaking now. We're much more familiar with documentary films at the cinema, of course, again, because of the collapse in many ways of televisual funding for more experimental and more author documentary work. So things change. It's not, it's not all doom and gloom, but the sense of a tradition that can be charted 
and actively responded to by unfolding waves of filmmakers is clearly a very different one now um, than it was when Marker and his fellow travellers were making this work in the late 60s. What is interesting to note, of course, that after this film, which had a certain mainstream cachet, of course, at least in its filmmaking lineup, um, it was genu gen generally felt by, by those involved, and of course, not least because of its screening history that I've just described, um, and by Marker himself, who's on the record as saying that, you know, we are very, very far from Vietnam in terms of the influence of this film and the hopes that we had for its making and its release. Um, he, he was rueful about, about the way that the film was closed down, not least in his home country as well as internationally, um, and perhaps therefore inevitable to a certain degree that he found himself going much more um, explicitly into a radical political filmmaking structure, as of course did Godard for five or six years into, into the early mid-70s. Both of them in different groupings um, explicitly signed themselves up to collective radicalised filmmaking, often anonymously authored among a, uh, a collaboration of, of individuals um, where they were making key texts, rhetorical texts, I mean politically um, te you know, inscribed texts, shall we say, in a way that this film is something uh, other. Um, and Goddard, of course, I guess the most extreme version of that with his com explicit Maoist commitment uh, and expressing that through filmmaking for five or six years. But both of them went into very, very direct uh, political engagement uh, with the moving image, uh, I guess thinking that you know, they had to make that stand and to make those uh, politics much more direct. Um, and then, of course... As times change, so they change as well. The other filmmakers, Joris Ivans, an uh, uh, exemplary lifelong career of co uh, committed filmmaking, but uh, broadly speaking, without that, obviously, without that rhetorical commitment. Um, Claude Lelouch, most famous for A Man and a Woman, of course, not the most radical text that we've come across, but uh, someone who obviously was subscribed to this project and then carried on to make regular um, features. Alain René, the great cinematic maestro of time and memory in a very different register, uh, and of course, uh, recently died himself as well, uh, and in later years collaborating many times with Alan Aitborn, um, who would have thought it? But they found obviously great uh, kindred um, concerns, shall we say, in their playing with time and linearity as well. So very, very interesting um, lineup of people, and of course we shouldn't in any way forget Agnes Varda, Marker's lifelong friend, they knew each other for 60 years. Uh, Agnes Varda made the only film which you can find online that entered into Marker's Atelier, his famous studio full of more cables than a cable company, uh, more hard drives, more obsolete technologies. Um, the great kind of heartbeat location of his global project. Uh, a lovely nine-minute film where she meets, uh, she meets Marker. We never see him, of course. Marker, the most unphotographed filmmaker of all time. Um, one of the interesting side products of the Far From Vietnam period is that it provides us with one of the two or three only iconic Iconic images of Marker, shaven-headed, being arrested by police, military police at the Pentagon. He was one of those great uh, Zelig figures of the 20th century, seemed to be in the right place at the right time to catch the image. Uh, and there he was uh, during the Pentagon protests in the 60s, uh, and arrested and photographed, being taken away, already then in his mid-40s, looking intense, exactly like you'd want him to look, hawk-like, focused, committed. Um, and that image uh, stays with us, really. That's the last uh, public image that we have of Marker um, from his earlier two or three younger photographs. So a very, very interesting character. Agnes Varda gives us his hands in her atelier study, um, and we hear him, of course, navigate around the cables and wires. But a very, very important filmmaker in her own right, of course, um, not least in terms of uh, the essay format that we're talking about with The Gleaners and I, her great film about, about poverty, uh, uh, not least in terms of the image, making the poor image uh, enriching uh, cinema through the most modest means. So a very, very interesting constellation of people, of course, all in their own right with extraordinary oeuvres. But this is a very particular film that comes out of a very particular moment, speaks to that time. I'm not in any way going to uh, presage the content of each of the uh, seven episodes at all, because many of those moments you will know um, from wider coverage of the war, of course. Um, but their take on it, gathered together as a single portmanteau project, um, remains one of the key texts of, of artists engaged engagement with conflict, not just the Vietnam conflict, but the larger cinematic engagement with war and with resistance, of course, um, that we have in cinema. So it's a great moment uh, for Marker, for his collaborators, and for film. I have no idea how long I've spoken for, Emma. How are we doing? <laughs>
we should wrap up, so that's good. Um, I hope that hasn't gone on too much. A bit of context um, on marker, on the filmmakers, um, on the uh, short film we're going to see first. Um, but I do hope you enjoy the programme. And uh, again, uh, we sort of dedicate this screening, I think, very much to the memory of both Chris Marker and Haroon Faraki. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you.